Ecology and Environmental Science Seminar. Appreciate seeing everybody here. And I know folks are excited to have Charlie Alpers here. I know that um, a lot of people have expressed a lot of interest, so that's great. And I can see by the nearly standing room only that uh, we have a lot of interest. So Charlie comes to us from USGS, the California Water Science Center, which is located on the campus of Sac State. And we appreciate you coming up here and uh, telling us more about the gold mines of this year in Nevada with foothills. So thank, thank you. you so much for being here. So most of you have uh, aware that you know, California has a rich mining history, and you may not be so aware of the environmental legacy such as the, uh, the arsenic contamination that's prevalent throughout a lot of the old gold mines. So uh, today I'm going to talk about, uh, particularly about Empire Mine, which is the largest uh, producing gold mine in, in California, but I'm also going to talk a bit about some of the other gold deposits in the Foothill uh, Gold Belt. A uh, large number of people that I've been working with on this over the last few years are listed here. I'm not going to go through them all, but you see by all the logos, local universities and other federal agencies and some state agencies have been involved. Uh, a lot of the work I'm going to talk about from Empire Mine is from the work of Tamsin Burlap, who was a uh, Sac State master's student who finished here a couple of years ago. She now works for Queen Harbors in San Diego, uh, which is an environmental organization. Um, the grant that uh, allowed this work to proceed was actually from US EPA, a so-called Brownfields program. And it was a rare opportunity where that program actually funded research. <laughs> a lot of it is that this funded remediation, which is all good, but, but the fundamental research that supports some of the work that's being done, uh, it, it's really hard to find funding for that uh, these days. But we were able to get a grant uh, through the US EPA, and the, the state agency that had the lead was called the Department of Toxic Substances Control, which is part of Cal EPA. And uh, Perry Myers is the project chief for, for um, this community, I'll call it DTSC, uh, and a number of other folks at DTSC also participated in the work. Uh, State Parks was instrumental because they own, own and manage the property of Empire Mine. They made that available. And I, I, I'll mention it a little bit as we go along, but uh, they've done a really amazing job there of doing cleanup on the site. There's actually 11 operable units. I don't know if you're familiar with the Superfund law, and, and, and like Iron Mountain has five operable units. That's the big Superfund site up in Reading, which we've also worked on. But the, um, they, they divided up the Empire Mine into 11 units, smaller pieces that they could they could fix a little bit at a time. So I'll talk a bit about some of those. Uh, and then we've got a lot of collaborators that I'll mention along the way at the various universities who've been doing part of the research on uh, focused on bioavailability of arsenic at, at, at Empire. Um, uh, we'll also mention Lisa Hamersley, a professor at Sac State, who's a, a co-advisor with Tams and Burlap and myself, and my USGS colleagues, colleagues, particularly Andrea Foster, who works in our Menlo Park office uh, in the Bay Area, and Alex Bloom, who uh, works out of our uh, Boulder, Colorado office. So uh, a brief outline of what I'm going to cover this afternoon. I'll talk about the gold mining history, first uh, on a national scale in California and in the Sierra Nevada, how uh, there's arsenic associated with it, as I mentioned. And, and I'm going to go quickly through several previous studies before we started our work at Empire Mine. There were there's, there's some nice work done at a few other mines in, in the Sierra Nevada on arsenic mineralogy and geochemistry. And I'll go into detail about our studies at Empire Mine. When we get into the mineralogy and geochemistry, we'll, we'll use the term speciation, really, just to chemical form of arsenic, whether it's uh, the most oxidized form, arsenic 5 plus, or the uh, slightly less oxidized form, arsenic 3 plus, or the arsenide form, uh, like some other sulfides where it's more reduced. Those play, play a big role, the speciation is very important when it comes to bioaccessibility or bioavailability, and I'll, I'll explain as we go along what those two mean. It's pretty easy to get them confused, so I use some color coding to help you through that. Uh, Bioaccessibility uh, which will be shown in green, and, and it says in vitro or in glass, that's what you can do in a, in a test tube, basically, to, to simulate what's in a stomach fluid. And that's basically what the amount of, um, of a metal, such as arsenic, that would be uh, potentially available and, and actually get into the bloodstream, um, uh, or at least be uh, modeled to do that through a, through a test that's not actually in a live organism. Bioavailability, which is the true test of what's in, in the blood, uh, is or also known as in vivo or in a living organism, uh, those, those are the more ex uh, expensive tests that we're trying to um, really are kind of the gold standard for recognizing whether something's really going to be harmful or not. So uh, one of the things that motivated the study is it would be nice if you could do the, a bioaccessibility test in a, in, a, in a 
test tube that was a lot cheaper than, say, feeding it to a lot of animals such as pigs or uh, mice or something that might cost thousands of dollars per sample, maybe even tens of thousands of dollars per sample, as opposed to maybe a hundred dollars a sample for something like this. So that was one of the ideas. Can we get a good correlation between these two so you can just trust the cheaper test uh, in the future? And that, that was one of the goals of the study. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about gold production in, in, the, in the United States. Uh, back when this slide was produced in 1998, California led the, uh, the nation in historical production. Nevada has since uh, surpassed California. Uh, there's a lot of large gold mines, open pit mines in northern Nevada, especially that have uh, made it the, the winner now, the leader. But uh, historically, of course, California's mother load and, 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 and also the uh, placer operations uh, in the state led to over a million, 100 million uh, ounces of gold having been produced out of a total historic production in the country of a little over 400 million. So you see California's responsible for, at this time, more than 25% of the nation's historic production. In terms of how that production is distributed through history, this is now in terms of ounces per year. And, uh, and these are from a, a nice review by Craig and Rimstead. Um, you can see at the time of the, the first discovery, 1848, there was a low production. Of course, the big gold rush in 1849, things went uh, extremely well the first few years. There was a lot of visible gold in the rivers, large nuggets. People were more, you know, concerned, uh, were able to come and, and sort of strike it rich early on. But that uh, eventually gave way to more mechanized production, larger scale mines, and, uh, and, and sort of a steady production through the late 1800s. There was uh, an important event in uh, 1884 when hydraulic mining was banned through the Sawyer decision, and that led to some decrease in production. Then the hard rock mining took over, and, uh, and, that, and, and that became the dominant type of production in the uh, 1880s and 90s. And then dredging, which is of course important over here in Or Oroville and all the other dredge fields, just the Yuba gold fields, that became very important in the early 1900s. Then in the, uh, oh, I've got some of the prompts here. Okay, there's a sort of decision. Um, in the 1930s, there was a resurgence of gold uh, production, and uh, especially underground mines, such as the Empire Mine, that we're going to talk about later. Uh, and then almost all the underground mining came to a halt in World War II, the so called L208, an executive order that curtailed all non essential uh, mining. Smaller mines were able to stay open, but uh, all the large mines shut down, and uh, uh, the gold industry really never recovered from that. There was some production in the 1950s. Costs kept increasing, miners went on strike, and the production pretty much ground to a halt in the early 1960s. And there was some resurgence, uh, particularly some uh, larger open pit mines in Southern California in the late uh, 1990s. The deregulation of gold price uh, and the increase in the price, of course, played a role in that as well. So uh, this map shows the distribution of gold mines. Every little gold dot is a produced, increasing gold mine, of which there are tens of thousands of them in California. You can see quite abundant here in the Northern Sierra Nevada, quite a few up in the Clinton Trinity Mountains as well, as well as down in the Mojave Desert. Uh, there's a whole other story. In fact, some of you may remember talking to you here a few years ago about mercury. and. Uh, there was there's mercury contamination all through this year in Nevada, but it wasn't naturally occurring. It was brought in from for amalgamation in the processing. Mercury mines occurring in the coast ranges uh, was the source of that mercury. Uh, that's a different story for a different day. But uh, I did bring a fact sheet about mercury and historical mining. If anybody's interested, you can pick one of these up after the talk. Um, but in addition to the um, the mercury problem, which is so, so largely introduced through the processing. The arsenic is a naturally occurring uh, contaminant that, that occurs with the gold, and, and in fact, <coughs> kind of makes a halo around the gold. Arsenic is a pathfinder only you can use if you're looking for a gold deposit. You might find an uh, anomalous arsenic in the soil, and, and you might be near a hydrothermal alteration zone that will lead you to a, a gold mineralization. There's also uh, lead associated with the, with the ore itself. It doesn't make as much of a halo. It's usually in the galena, lead sulfide that occurs right with the gold and the quartz veins. Whereas the arsenic might be more dispersed in the, in the country rock, perhaps in dissolved in pyrite, as we'll see. Um, I'll go through the mineralogy a little later. Um, so there are a lot of areas where, where de development is encroaching on historic mines. Uh, I'm not sure if that's been a problem right around here as much as some other areas, but uh, for example, in Nevada County and, and also Hanover County, uh, <coughs> people have tried to build houses on old tailings piles, not, perhaps not knowing that it was contaminated. And uh, sometimes it's the only flat spot in town, and it uh, seems like a convenient place to put a housing development. And uh, there have been a few of those that, as we'll see, that have led to some problems. Uh, but one of the big 
questions that comes up when people start uh, wanting to develop an area, whether it's naturally occurring arsenic that's just in the natural soils, <coughs> or whether it's mine waste rocks that have been ground up and processed and then disposed of. There might be 100 or 200 parts per million arsenic in this material, and that might be over a, a, a regulatory limit, but that regulatory limit is assuming all that arsenic is bioavailable. What if uh, it's largely not bioavailable? What if it's in the form of, say, arsenic pyrite, which might be a, a not bioavailable form of arsenic? Maybe uh, it would be okay to build on that if only, say, 10% of the arsenic is bioavailable. Then if it's tests out at 100 ppm, it maybe behaves more like 10 ppm if it were ingested. And, uh, so that's one of the challenges regulator regulators have in trying to decide whether to allow these types of uh, properties to be developed. And uh, the science that we're trying to do in, in this project would be to help support that, that an understanding of how mineralogy uh, factors into bioavailability and whether it could be predicted, as I mentioned, using relatively inexpensive uh, metrics. So that's the overlying question for risk assessment, how bioavailable is the arsenic in this type of mine waste, from, especially from hard rock mines. This is a schematic cross-section from a, a report by Roger Ashley, one of my USGS colleagues, uh, who is now an emeritus scientist. Uh, this is a scale of kilometers down to 15 kilometers depth. And you see here's the green schist lipidolite transition. And uh, we also have the brittle ductile transition. So it's engaged in pretty deep environments here, which we call hypozonal and mesozonal, which is uh, where you get these um, shear zones and serpentinites and uh, you maybe uh, at a depth of, say, 8 to 15 kilometers, that's where the arsenic tends to be concentrated in these hydrothermal systems. At shallower depths, you have mercury and antimony being more associated with gold. So this is more of a hot spring environment. And some of the deposits over in the coast ranges, such as the McLaughlin mine uh, up here at Clear Lake, you might be familiar with that. That's a, really an, an active hot spring area that's had, had very little erosion. In fact, you can say it's still presently formed in the geysers type of uh, geothermal system. So you tend to get uh, a lot of mercury in, in that environment. But as you uh, road down geologically, down to five or more kilometers, you, you tend to uh, you road through the natural mercury and antimony zones and into the zones where arsenic is more associated with gold. Now, these, this is uh, a series of maps that were published by uh, J.K. Bulky, who was a <coughs> classmate at UC Berkeley. Uh, we did our PhDs together. He, he focused on the Allegheny area up in uh, uh, the northern Sierra Nevada. And AD is the Allegheny district. So this map is borrowed from, from his report. Uh, it's actually a, a neat paper they wrote, a GSA special paper uh, honoring the, the old work of Lindgren in 1995. This is Lindgren's map showing the, the major gold districts. You can see here's Butte County and Chico right there. And um, the uh, map in the middle shows every dot uh, to be a, a producing, historically producing gold mine. And uh, we're going to focus on Empire Mine, which is located here in the Grass Valley. Uh, area, Grass Valley District, you can see a very large cluster of, of gold mines in there. Uh, and it was the, the most the, the most productive of all the, the hard rock mining districts in California. Uh, the true mother load is in this southern area, the Maloney's Fault Zone, uh, which goes right along Highway 49 here, um, happily named by Highway 49, right? So, yeah, another accident. And uh, the uh, uh, Clark 1970 is a kind of definitive uh, reference on gold deposits in California by, by the California Geological Survey. And he's very clear to say the mother load kind of ends right here. And because you've got uh, these, these eastern belts, and, and the, when it's not fault related, and once you get up to Grass Valley, it's really not mother load anymore. We, we call this the northern mines. So uh, that's, you know, people might uh, be confused about that and, and uh, want to consider Grass Valley part of the mother load. It's kind of a semantic distinction. But uh, the, the true definition of the kind of starts on here and goes on south. Uh, down in this area, there is an east belt and a west belt as well. And there are some different geological characteristics. I'm going to talk today about some of the some deposits uh, in, in the, the true mother road down here near uh, Don Pedro Reservoir uh, in um, uh, the Jackson area, as well as some other deposits up here in Nevada County, in addition to, uh, to Empire Mine. Uh, So this uh, slightly exalted map of California also shows the major gold districts. And uh, again, the, the term load deposit really refers to, to uh, in place quartz veins. The, uh, the, the geological classification is uh, low sulfide uh, gold quartz vein deposits. Uh, and you can divide the, the uh, Sierra Nevada 
put the gold belt into the northern and southern parts, and again, the true mother load is all in the south and just a little bit into the northern part. And there are some different geological characteristics of the two, uh, these two belts. And again, this, this comes from previous work by uh, Hoshman and Bergenthal. And also, um, Roger Ashley put together some data on the arsenic content of gold ores, actually sampling ore material from various mines. And uh, there's about uh, a dozen or so mines represented in here. And there's a little bit of overlap. But by and large, the southern belt mines uh, have lower arsenic content, up to about 500 parts per million or milligrams per kilogram. This is a logarithmic scale. Uh, and then arsenic is on the vertical axis. Gold is on the horizontal axis. Uh, and it's also in parts per million. So uh, anything over a part per million these days would be considered gold ore. Of course, in the older days, uh, an ounce per ton, down to about a tenth of an ounce per ton, which would be in the sort of 30 parts per million range, what you need to be gold for, uh, let's say, 3 to 30 parts per million is the average gold ore grade. Um, but in the north, you have the higher arsenic overall in these ore samples. You also have the occurrence of the mineral arsenic of pyrite only in the north, whereas in both north and south, you have pyrite that is arsenic bearing, and it can actually get up to 5 or 6 weight percent arsenic, and we call that arsenian pyrite. And we distinguish that from arseno pyrite, which is a true arsenic bearing mineral where arsenic is a stoichiometric uh, part of the crystal structure. Whereas in, in the pyrite, as we'll see, the arsenic substitutes for sulfur, but it never gets up to more than a few mole percent on that uh, crystallographic site. So, pretty big difference uh, regionally between the north and the south. Um, we're going to go through some of the primary minerals or minerals that occur uh, in the original deposits and in, in the, in the form with the quartz veins, and then secondary minerals that form during weathering. Uh, so pyrite, especially low sulfur, uh, sorry, low arsenic pyrite, uh, tends to weather your crops or garden variety uh, arsenic, uh, iron oxides, such as butite and perihydrite. These collectively can be called uh, hydrospheric oxides, or HFO. You might see that abbreviation as we go along. Uh, when you get to the arsenium pyrite, again, up to about 5% arsenic is, from a capital point of view, the maximum we've seen, say, at Empire Mine. And again, the arsenic substitutes for sulfur, so it's it has a net charge of minus one. Uh, arsenic can go all the way down to minus three, and, our, and sulfur can go down to minus two as the most reduced form. But as you may know from, from pyrite, the sulfur has a net charge of minus one, uh, to, and two of them balance off a of plus two in the iron. So the arsenic is also in a minus one form when it's in, in, in pyrite. Um, there's some additional minerals that uh, tend to be weathering products when you get into the higher arsenic or um, uh, original primary uh, Minerals. Jarosite, which is a calcium ferric sulfate, can have about one weight percent arsenic, and again, the arsenic substitutes for sulfur, but now it's in the oxidized form. Uh, arsenate, substitute for sulfate. And then copiapite is another sulfate mineral with both ferrous and ferric iron, and you can also have a small amount of arsenic substituting for the sulfur in uh, copiapite. And then, uh, you can also get the same vertite and ferric hydride minerals. Uh, but they can contain up to six or more percent of arsenic. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's not as clear where the arsenic resides in the structure. It, it may be adsorbed on the surface. These are very fine grain materials, so that you might get a very high surface area and, and have a lot of arsenic there. It could also be there's some arsenate uh, substituting in for some of the oxygen. That's a little bit unclear still. Uh, when you get to arsenopyrite, the mineral I mentioned earlier, it actually has arsenic right in the structure an equal molar quantity to the sulfur in the iron, uh, or 46 weight percent altogether. Uh, you can, now you can get ferritite and hydrate with up to 20 weight percent arsenic. We'll still call that HFO. Uh, there's there's a, a kind of, as you'll see, a, kind of a gradation into stuff with even more than 20 weight percent arsenic. We call that HFA, hydrospheric arsenate. And it's somewhat of a continuum here. There's, it's just an arbitrary distinction that we made in the literature uh, when the iron arsenic ratio re uh, reaches a certain point we start calling it uh, HFA instead of HFO. Uh, and I'll show you some diagrams that make that a little more clear. And then finally, there's some uh, arsenate minerals, scoridite and arseniosiderite, which have ASO4, or the most oxidized form of arsenic. That's arsenic 5 plus combined with oxygen to make ASO4, which has a net charge of minus 3. Uh, so ferric iron plus 3, arsenate minus 3, and water hydration. That mineral has 32-8% arsenic. And it turns out to be not that bioavailable but arsenio siderite, which has calcium in it, turns out to be one of the most bioavailable phases. So just because it's in the arsenate form doesn't necessarily make it super bioavailable, but it turns out the, the most bioavailable phases are uh, calcium-bearing iron arsenates. 
this. And it turns out there's a few other calcium bearing iron arsenates. I hope you're taking notes because we'll be a quiz. Uh, we've got euconite, or, as I mentioned, arsenium siderite, pharmacosiderite. You probably thought anything that's called siderite would have carbonate in it, right? Because siderite is iron carbonate. But lo and behold, there are minerals that have siderite in them in their name that are not iron carbonates. Just for your confusion. So, uh, the euconite is a mineral that was, as you might imagine, first uh, discovered up in Canada. And uh, the Canadian, our Canadian colleagues have done quite a bit of work on this, although there's about four or five different formulas in the literature. That's one that's really not that well characterized yet. It clearly has some combination of calcium, ferric iron, and arsenate. But um, we get maybe several minerals when we get down to it uh, and really understanding these in detail that are considered euconite like. And I'll explain uh, in our Empire Mind data, we actually have some unknown uh, compositions that are close to it, but not exactly that. Let's see, there's a couple other, the, the HFA that I mentioned, one um, description of the literature that was a pretty careful study using transmission electron microscopy uh, by Pak Tunk and, and uh, Brueggemann and there's some other papers by Pak Tunk. They, uh, they think that it might be a nanoscale mixture of basically ferric hydroxide, we have some more features here, okay, uh, ferric hydroxide and iron arsenate. This amorphous iron arsenate is known to form. You can make this in the laboratory. And if you make a mixture of this and, and, uh, and ferric hydride or, or, or very poorly crystalline iron oxide and, and mix it in the nail, so you get a variable composition of these things with a variable amount of water. That's why this stuff is very hard to characterize. But we, we're finding it, and again, as a weathering product of arsenic pyrite, and it, it, it may be one of the uh, important phases to understand as far as uh, bioavailability. So, as I mentioned, there, some phases turn out to be a lot more bioavailable than others, whether you me measure it in live organisms in vivo testing or in stomach fluid simulations called in vitro testing. And it could be that you may have a, a small amount of something, say like pharmacosideride or racinosideride in your sample. It might represent only 1% of the, of the arsenic, but it may represent half of the bioavailable arsenic, just because it's so much more uh, soluble and bioavailable in, in stomach conditions. So this is a cartoon that just kind of shows the different kinds of mine waste that we have. Um, and how the different um, types of arsenic or min minerals and species, species of arsenic might occur within a hard rock mining site. We have waste rock, which uh, is material that's mined, but it's below ore grade and it's just discarded without any processing or crushing. And that material sometimes can have more sulfide than the original rock. Uh, can, and then mill tailings are the actual ore that's been ground up and the ore minerals that you're after, such as the gold in this case, have been extracted. Uh, you, if the, the metallurgy that's involved in gold mining, uh, there's some cases where they take out the pyrite because it has gold in it, but they leave behind the arsenopyrite on purpose. So you may end up with tailings that have a higher arsenic content than the original rock because they, they've learned over time that, that they said pyrite has gold and arsenopyrite doesn't. Um, there were less sophisticated operations where they, you know, they, they just left, they, they maybe took all the sulfides and put them through different types of plants to. Uh, to decompose the sulfides and liberate the gold. So you get a wide range of sulfide content in both waste rock and mill tailings. Sometimes they'll be a concentrate, again, knowing that some of the, that the gold will be, be associated with, with sulfide minerals, such as galena and pyrite. The miners would uh, create a, a concentrate of sulfides, but maybe they never got around to processing it or sending it to, uh, to either a smelter or a roaster or some way to, because you, you can't just put a sulfide concentrate into a cyanide, which is the, the gold, um, Extraction method of choice starting around 1910 or 20 uh, because the cyanide will interact with the sulfide. So you need to oxidize those sulfides first. So sometimes they left these concentrates lying around because they didn't get around to processing them or pre processing them prior to cyanidation. And these can lead to acid conditions because you have a lot of uh, pyrite, let's say, and nothing to neutralize it. In the mill tailings and the waste rock in the middle, you tend to have carbonate minerals such as uh, calcite, dolomite, and um, you consider it that uh, can play some role in neutralizing the acids that are generated when the pyrite oxidizes. But if you have a sulfide concentrate without much carbonate, this will generate acid runoff. Whereas the, the runoff from most mill tailings associated with gold mining are actually uh, neutral. When you get the acid waters, you can of course kill fish just from the acidity. You can, you can solubilize copper, zinc, uh, lead, and some other, other nasties that uh, you know, are an additional concern. So I, I mentioned also that the most oxidized form of Arsenic is arsenate, so the plus five, and it has four oxygens. Arsenite uh, has a plus three, and uh, it tends to be surrounded with three oxygens. 
So, the story about arsenic in coal mining country here uh, actually hit the national news about tw almost 20 years ago here in 1995 in Time Magazine. There was a story called Arsenic at Old Mines, which is a take up on arsenic and old waste. <coughs> one movie, Spencer Tracy, I believe. The um, Mesa de Oro subdivision in uh, the, near the Central Eureka Mine in, in Sutter Creek, California, down in Edmonton County. They found that uh, they, were, they were building a subdivision on mine waste that had about a thousand parts per million arsenic, which is up in the range considered unsafe. And this led to a super fund or CERCLA cleanup in the late 1990s at a cost of about $7 million. This is a plan view showing Mesa de Oro and how close it was to the mine and how it's basically a residential area now. And the top of the hill was kind of ground zero for this. And, and there's these steep slopes around it, which uh, uh, had a lot of fine grained arsenic rich material. But people are still living there because they put a couple feet of topsoil and everything and held it good. Uh, one of the uh, pieces of research that was done back then by some of my USGS colleagues had to do with what form is the arsenic in. The, they used uh, the synchrotron radiation at, at the Stanford uh, light source, the SSRL. And it's a nice way to, to tell the form of arsenic. You get a peak shift if the ox arsenic is in the minus one oxidation state of arsenic pyrite. You see the black line. And if it's in the arsenite or plus five state associated here with hydrosphere oxides, you get a very distinct shift to the, uh, to the plus five. And so uh, it turns out that the plus five is uh, more bioavailable than, than the minus one. And most of the, um, some of the early work show, well, there's arsenic pyrite, so we shouldn't have to worry about it. But then um, the mesa de oro samples came out in, in more oxidized form, and that, that were, they, were, they were more concerned. So this is one of the first studies in California showing the importance of uh, understanding the species of arsenic and how it would affect bioavailability and toxicity. And this is a story that the Mercury News back in 1993. Now, a little closer to home up here, the lava cop mine. Any of you familiar with that one in near Grass Valley? It's actually a super fun site. They had an uh, interesting event in the flood. Remember, it used to rain around here. There was a flood back in 1997 uh, that uh, was considered about a 1 to 200 year interval event. And it caused quite a bit of flooding. Uh, and it caused the failure of a tailings dam here in the Lava Cup cap mine. It's just a little bit east of Grass Valley uh, in this area that actually drains into Greenhorn Creek and down into the Bear River. And uh, what happened was uh, this little dam right here it was actually a, a log crib tailings dam, and it, it failed during the flood. And a bunch of material, which is ground up uh, mine waste, basically mill tailings, that were, the gold had been removed, but the arsenic had been left behind to the quartz. That flowed down Little Cooper Creek and filled in this area here uh, in an area called Lost Lake, which was a nice little residential community, five or six homes around a nice idyllic little pond here. First, they found out later this is another tailings pond, and the water they were drinking was also contaminated because uh, this whole area had all, another impoundment of historical mine towns that people living there had no idea. Uh, and so, this material that came down the creek um, uh, settled there, and then kids were playing in it. I think there's a kid playing in it over here. That's the tailings dam. Uh, and there's a kid playing in it soon after uh, the, uh, the flood in 1997. Before they told them that, that's probably a bad idea because it was. Toxic levels of arsenic. Mm -hmm. Then the folks around here got their wells tested and found out, yeah, they had high arsenic also. Um, so my colleague, uh, Andrea Foster, uh, worked out there and she found that in, in the, the, the lake that there was you know, this flock or iron oxidized, oxidized iron that uh, precipitated and it absorbed a lot of arsenic. This is actually a graph, it's kind of hidden by all the photos here, but this is a, a linear scale of arsenic in parts per million. And the tailings and the algae are all down in the lower levels, of, you know, under a thousand parts per million. It's still it's still contaminated. Um, but in this in this environment, we got uh, you know several thousand. And then there was one one series of samples that were these uh, very uh, flock-rich materials that were actually in the ten thousand to twenty thousand range. So actually, up in the one to two percent arsenic in some of this material, it was very fine grained and it does a nice job. Iron is actually very effective at absorbing arsenic. It will. Uh, I don't know if you've learned about um, places where arsenic uh, is abundant in groundwater and they want to treat it. Well, you can use iron oxide to remove arsenic from drinking water supplies. So it's very effective as absorption agent. And uh, this is an example of sort of happening naturally in this contaminated system. So when uh, Andrea Foster uh, analyzed this, this material, she saw that uh, 
using the XAS technique, which again is the synchrotron radiation, she could see that there was a arsenic associated with uh, the most oxidized form in, in all these cases, and that uh, uh, she uses various uh, techniques such as uh, the combination to have an issue. These are basically, basically different ways of trying to flip the curves you get from the, the synchrotron and uh, try to understand the speciation. But uh, basically, uh, it's, it's the um, uh, oxidized form. There's also a, a microbial effect here because the, the reason these flocks exist is because of iron oxidation by microbes. So in studying these systems in detail, one really does need to consider the microbial activity as well. But it, and mostly how it affects iron cycling. Microbes will also affect arsenic cycling. The oxidation of the arsenic itself is mediated by microbes. And there's some microbes that actually produce arsenic back down. So it, it gets very complex when you start getting into all the possible microbial uh, interactions. Okay, so um, we're going to take a little detour down the southern, southern part of the Mother Road, the uh, Don Pedro Reservoir area. There's the uh, Shaman and Eagle deposits, which are uh, some of the waste is actually flooded by Don Pedro Reservoir, as we'll see. Uh, so there's the Cleo Mine here, and there's also the Harvard pit part of the Jamestown Mining District uh, here, just north of uh, Don Pedro. And this is down in Tuolumne County. And this is a historic photograph showing uh, the old mine at um, the, Sh the Eagle and Shaman. And you can see what used to be Wentz Creek is now uh, covered by Don Pedro Reservoir. Here's the high water level. You can see that these mine wastes that were left out there, uh, they didn't clean them up before they made the reservoir. They just said, okay, uh, we're going to flood this area. Everybody get out. And then I think they tore down the buildings, but they left the tans pile. So uh, Kay Savage was doing a PhD thesis at Stanford uh, in the 1990s. And she uh, actually got some help from myself and one of my USGS colleagues, and we went out in a boat and, and took core samples into the tailings, and she characterized those as part of her thesis. Uh, and this shows the location of some of the cores that were done in the old historic mine waste uh, just offshore of the Shaman and Eagle mines. This is one of the uh, uh, SEM fo photos from her work. This is actually a um, backscatter image that shows the um, mean atomic number and you can translate that into higher arsenic when you get to uh, a higher weight, a higher average number, and that makes a brighter color. You see that there's zoning of these on these uh, pyrite crystals. The rims tend to be lower in arsenic, and the cores here tend to be higher, up to three and four weight percent. And um, we see similar effects at the uh, at the Empire Mine. This is one nice example of it. And we also have these nice twin pyrite crystals. And you can see the scale here up to a millimeter. Uh, this is a, a diagram from Kay's uh, thesis and the resulting publication. She, she's working with Professor Dennis Bird down at Stanford, who um, actually owns a ranch right along the Mullowies Fault, including a few gold prospects. So they were able to uh, to sample right on, right on the Mullowies Fault zone in a road cut and get some pyrite from there. And they sent some <coughs> other available areas from the Shaman Mine, from uh, this other area that, that uh, had them in mind, and then uh, some areas that are a little further away from the Mullowies Fault zone. And they showed in general how uh, you get up to 2% uh, arsenic in the pyrite right near the Maloney's Fault. And as you go further away, the maximum arsenic in the pyrite drops off. And when you're two, two to three kilometers away, you, you tend to have less than a half a weight percent arsenic. So you can see how arsenic could be a pathfinder if you're out looking for a, a, a hidden fault zone. If you follow the arsenic content of the pyrite, it might, might lead you to the, uh, to the goal. I took that same data and compared it to Empire Mine, and I changed it to a logarithmic scale here. And so you can see, that, again, the, the increasing arsenic as you get closer to the Mullowney's Fault. And then the overall distribution of arsenic and pyrite at Empire Mine kind of spans the full range of this. And in Empire Mine, again, we're not associated directly with the Mullowney's Fault. It's a more dispersed type of with a number of different structures. And so uh, you know, the relationships are not quite as, as simple, but we definitely have that full range of arsenic and pyrite down from less than a tenth of a weight percent up to several weight percent in some of the outliers. So back to Case Savage's work in the southern part of the road. Um, here's the uh, shaman where he just looked at the uh, pyrite and, and the uh, submerged tailings. Now we're going to go up to the Harvard Open Pit, which is a said near Jamestown, part of the Jamestown Mining District. And this shows what the Harvard Pit looks like. Uh, it's about 10, 15 years ago. It's the water levels continues to rise. They're actually concerned about it spilling out and over into uh, into Woods Creek. This this water has quite high arsenic concentrations and very high sulfate. And it's, it's a concern, and it is a concern about high sulfate and some of the neighboring drinking uh, water wells around here as well. Uh, this, the, the, there's a fault that goes right through the pit. I'll show you the geological map in a moment. There's kind of a, a geologic contact along this fault. 
Uh, and this shows you here the, uh, the um, hanging wall side up on the, to the right and, uh, and the eastern side and the, and the football over here. The war zone is really right along that fault contact. Uh, Kay did her work along these benches and some of the springs that were coming into the pit as well. And this is a photograph showing uh, now looking the other way with the football on the right, hanging on the left, and, and you see the veins kind of going through here in the ore zone. And again, USGS helped uh, Kay with this work, uh, sampling from boats and, and looking at profiles in the water column and so forth. And uh, she did a, a number of uh, uh, observations out there looking at uh, arsenic at different depths as well as some other characteristics such as the oxygen content and, and other uh, aspects of the groundwork for the water quality. And so this is the water level. You can see it's starting to rise uh, from 1995. The state of California did some work. And then uh, case thesis kicked in here and the water level rose from about, about 50 feet during those three years. And uh, the arsenic concentrations uh, I guess our, our contour here, uh, and there's these are in parts per billion, and uh, the, um, they get, in some cases, in these deeper waters, over a thousand parts per billion or parts per million of uh, arsenic in the water. Uh, and you know, 10 parts per billion is the drinking water standard, so all these are way above that by a couple orders of magnitude. Uh, KS kind of a conceptual model of how things work if within the pit waters of the harbor pit. There's, uh, in terms of the mineralogy, there's these oxidized forms, grutite, gerasite, copiapite, all arsenic 5 plus. These are the weathering products. They started out in arsenium pyrite, as we mentioned before, that there's a little bit of arsenic substitute for sulfur in the pyrite. So you get these secondary products. Uh, there's also quite a bit of carbonates in the wall rock that neutralize the acid. So if you have neutral water, you have high arsenic in the deep, the deep waters. Uh, you also get some salts that form. Uh, and there's also some very alkaline springs that come out right here where the water table intersects the, the wall, the round wall, uh, the, uh, the pit wall. And so um, she did a nice job of describing all these different environments and how the chemistry was a little different and led to different secondary minerals. And then uh, in the wet season, we get the solution of some of these salts that have water quality. Uh, these are some pictures of her, from her work. Uh, magnesium copiapite <coughs> is uh, uh, one of the more common salts, uh, has magnesium and iron as well as uh, lots of sulfate. The gerasite that we mentioned, they can have a small amount of arsenic in it, here's your type, and the, the original culprit, the arsenium pyrite, uh, in the polished section. Okay, so I think we're finally ready to uh, move up north to the Empire Mine. And uh, I'll be talking about the Scratch Valley Mining District a little bit in the, in the, in the regional geology. Uh, this has um, this regional map, which is from Tamsin Verlax thesis, shows some intrusive rocks and granitic plutons in orange. And uh, within the Grass Valley uh, area, particularly within Empire Mine State Park, th this uh, kind of thick gray line is the boundary of, of the park. It's largely granitic rocks at the surface, and as you go deeper, you can get into a, uh, a rock that was originally mapped as porphyrite. It's uh, probably uh, diorite in, 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 um, in today's terminology, and the original mapping by Linger in 1895. And uh, we can see some of the waste rock piles are shown here. So there are these. Uh, fault structures and, and the, the, or, uh, localize some of the larger quartz veins and uh, that's where these smaller smaller mines are where these uh, the small waste deposits are. The largest waste deposit here is from the deepest part of the mine, the Empire, uh, Empire Mine itself. So let me go through briefly some again and reiterate some of the objectives of our bioavailability study. Uh, as I mentioned, the Cal EPA is trying to develop cost-effective characterization methods, particularly relating the in vitro bioaccessibility to the more expensive in vivo testing. Um, and particularly for this, this deposit type, the low sulfide gold quartz veins, and, and we're trying to, again, determine if the speciation mineralogy and also grain size may have something to do with bioavailability. And if ultimately the goal is to improve the in vitro methodology so it's more predictive in vivo so that somebody wanting, wanting to go out and build in this stuff wouldn't have to pay ten or $20,000 per sample to get a, a, a test, an in vivo test using, say, a lot of pigs. They could spend $100 on a, a simulation of human stomach fluid. So the in vivo work is done by Stan Castile at the University of Missouri. He's got a pig farm down there, and he specializes in feeding uh, toxic things to pigs. They put in a little dough ball, and the pigs eat it up. And there's no adverse effects to the pig. I'm pretty sure of that they have to do everything in, in triplicate, and it's uh, and somebody's got to collect all the well. They, they use the urine, not the feces, thing. But anyway, they, they do um, they do look at that in detail. The um, the in vitro work is done here. In Ohio State University, Nick Bosta is a professor, Shane Whitaker is a graduate student, and uh, 
they're developing these newer methods to, to simulate stomach fluids. Our USGS team is using the uh, synchrotron work that I mentioned with Andrea Foster. We're also working with Chris Kim, who's a professor at um, Chapman University in Orange, California. He also does synchrotron work, and he's doing some detailed size analysis I'll show a little later. Uh, Tamsin did microprobe work at UC Davis as part of her thesis. You know, she's a Sac State student. We used UC Davis as microprobe. Uh, the Quem scan is a really cool method I'll talk to you about. We used the University of Utah's instrument for that with Professor Eric Peterson. And we did bulk X-ray diffraction and X-ray fluorescence at USGS in Boulder with Alex Bloom. And um, again, trying to relate mineralogy to bioaccessibility for the large team of people. I actually ran a field trip out to Empire Mine uh, in June of 2014. This is the largest uh, dump on the property of the Empire Mine dump. And this has all the different rock types because this, this acts as tunnels that go down more than 5,000 feet below the surface into the main tunnel. How many have been to Empire Mine State Park? It's a pretty nice visitor center they've got there. You just probably poked your head down the old shaft, the incline shaft, which is just right behind us here. This is material that came out of that incline shaft at deeper parts of the mine. And, um, uh, but this is actually not accessible to the public. So if you go back out there, don't, don't go looking for the mine waste box because you're going to be But uh, there, there is, they, they've done a pretty good job of separating the mine waste from where people go now. But for a while, the trails were contaminated. I'll explain that in a little, a little bit. Uh, okay, so uh, the field trip we led, I'll just mention before I forget, uh, we actually had a two-day short course on arsenic, and uh, this presentation I'm giving now was largely developed for that short course we had in Nevada City back in June, and we published a book that just came out this week on um, arsenic, and uh, this material I'm talking about today is largely in the chapter in, uh, in there, in our mind. Uh, and it's sort of a field trip guide to MRC. But if you do go back, you will be able to follow that guide and sort of a self guided tour. Uh, this is one of the graphics we developed for the, uh, the field trip in the chapter. This shows, uh, again, the park boundary. And all these dots were field XRF data for arsenic. And the dark red ones are over 1,000 uh, parts per million. With the medium red are 270 to 1,000. And the green ones are under 270. Now, 270 is still pretty high, but that, that's the practical limit that they put out there. Uh, again, assuming there was some bio, limited bioavailability, they figured if it's over 270, they really had to do something about it in terms of human exposure. They're, this is never going to be residential, but in terms of the, the incidental exposure you might get if you were walking your dog out there, or riding on a horse, running on the trails, they wanted to make sure these trails are under 270 ppm to be safe for human activity. But prior to the study, all these red dots were over 270. You can see they had a pretty big problem as some of these trails went right by these old mine sites and old mice waste piles, and they actually used mine waste to create the trails. <laughs> Bad idea. But they've since uh, rerouted some trails, put down some clean dirt, and, uh, and the new map would be all green, which is, I thought they've done a nice job of fixing that uh, as of 2013. And they've <coughs> some trails back in 2006, so to, to look at the fix uh, <laughs> Uh, this is another map that shows the distribution of arsenic. The, the bigger the circle, the more total arsenic. And the bioaccessible arsenic is this little sliver. So you can see that uh, most of the sites we looked at had very low percent of bioavailable arsenic. But because the total arsenic was so high, you know, 10% of 10,000 ppm is still 12,000 ppm of bioavailable arsenic. That's still way too high. So uh, even though it wasn't that bioavailable, you can still have a decent about it. And this just shows what some of these trails look like prior to remediation. Basically, there's a road that they cut this one off now, but it's basically just a dirt road that goes through the mine waste and it's naturally occurring arsenic that's pretty high. And uh, when, when we, this is what some, you can't see that too, but it's like this is a pile of rocks in the woods. That's what some of these old piles look like. Relatively small underground mines. This happens to be the Woodbury mine. A couple of small piles, about you know, 10, 10 15 feet high. But the fine grain material has 10,000 feet in one percent arsenic. And uh, we have, we, we excavated that with the help of a local contractor, and they would have dug with the backhoe, and they actually put it through a quarter-inch screen out in the field, filled up a bunch of buckets, and sieved it down, and, and then they shipped uh, several buckets of the material to Ohio State, where they put it into uh, less than 250 micron size, and split that and sent it out to all the researchers. But they had a large stockpile of these well-characterized samples for future studies, and uh, that's what uh, Nick Bosco, our collaborator, says this stuff is worth more than gold because <laughs> when you spend thousands of dollars to characterize the material, you still have more of it. People want to borrow it and put it in different tests and it's, it's really useful to have these well characterized materials. So we, we looked at 24 samples for this study and uh, 12 of them were fed to pigs uh, for in vivo testing because they said it costs over $10,000 per sample to do that. 
And it, it, as part of the, the Jansen Bell Act's thesis, she looked at, uh, again, the, the pyrite, and they actually cut another pyrite. You can, it's a little subtle, but can you see that every color is a gray over here? And uh, again, the brighter uh, color represents higher arsenic. And there's also, again, even more subtle over here, there's some zones of this that have slightly brighter gray and darker gray. That represents heterogeneity of the arsenic content of the pyrite. And it's clear down here as well. Which is, you can see that. And then um, uh, one, one uh, thing we learned from the literature is that the arsenic content of pyrite can affect how fast it oxidizes. Uh, it's basically the arsenic rich zones are, have more defects and they're more susceptible to rapid oxidation. So that's a factor in trying to understand the weathering history of these, that, that maybe the, the zones that have higher arsenic will erode faster and, uh, and liberate arsenic more rapidly and, 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 and a higher percentage than was originally in the, uh, in the material. So when Tamsin did her work, we, we divided, uh, we looked at just overall pyrite content, uh, the arsenic in the pyrite. We also looked at our single pyrite and cobalt type, which is a, a co cobalt arsenic sulfide. And of course, those are up to 40% uh, arsenic, and the pyrite has this range. The HFO and the HFA, I said, it's kind of an arbitrary division at about uh, 18 weight percent. And uh, so we had quite a bit of this HFA material that had, uh, you know, 20 to 40 weight percent arsenic in addition to the hydrospheric oxides. We split them into low, medium, and high, uh, in, in both of the pyrite as well as the HFO itself, uh, just as a way of kind of mapping things out. And um, think, I'm going to show a map that shows the same things. This is for the overall site. You see, there's about an equal amount of low, medium, and high arsenic. Here, the medium is 0.15 to 1% arsenic, arsenic in the pyrite. And I think we consider high anything over a weight percent. And there's an equal amount with, with less than 0.5, which is our detection limit for, for our uh, arsenic and pyrite. And then the HFO was tended to be more of the stuff greater than 1%, and it's a relatively small number of, of microprobe points that were in the in medium and low range. So you can see all, all, already there's a kind of a tendency for the weathering products to be higher in arsenic than the primary material, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and then when we look at this spatially, if you remember, as you go from left to right, it goes from low medium to high. So in our mind dump, we see you know, more of the high arsenic, both in the primary and the secondary. Uh, and we see this high arsenic oxides in the northern part. In the southern part, we tend to get a little more of the lower arsenic in pyrite and the, the lower arsenic in the weathering products as well. So there's a little bit of north-south zoning. But by and large, we see high arsenic weathering products just about everywhere. Uh, and so some of the textures that, that Tim's have documented were Kind of a replacement texture, the oxides kind of coming in little microfractures inside the, of the pyrite veins, replacing it from the inside out. And uh, again, basically, you see a lot of this uh, microfracturing that controls the distribution of the secondary minerals. And this is also, that was on pyrite, you can see a similar thing on our senior pyrite. We see uh, a lot of microfractures that control it. And we see rimming uh, as well, the secondary minerals rimming the primary minerals, and kind of a relic grain of it, in this case, our senior pyrite in the middle here. Uh, and so she did some quantitative work showing that, again, quantitatively, that the weathering products have a higher arsenic to iron ratio than the original material. I won't go through this in too much detail, but we had a slope of about 2 to 1. Uh, the the, weather, the um, weathering products had higher arsenic to iron ratios than the original material. These are some microprobe data that she generated that show the um, iron content on the right and arsenic on the vertical axis. And we see this kind of continuum I mentioned between vertite and ferrihydra, which are the pure hydrospheric oxides. And it's sort of amorphous ferric arsenate, which uh, could be the mineral scoridite, and as well crystalline. And so this material in between here, we consider that the hydrospheric arsenate, which we might have a, more balloons here. So this is the HFO and the HFA, but it is kind of an arbitrary distinction. We have kind of a continuum between these. And it may, again, it might be, represent a really fine nanoscale mixture between these very important crystalline components. But the majority of the materials are down here. And then if we um, compare this to a previous study done in Canada by a path junk at a place called the Ketsurama, you see a pretty similar distribution. There's some minor differences. He had a little more of the Yukonite, Pomposiderite, or Seniociderite, these calcium bearing minerals. He had more of those than we did here at the Empire Mine. But we had a little bit of scoridite and a lot of this HFO, HFA. Another plot that path junk looked at that's instructed is arsenic versus calcium, again, microprobe data. And our data from Empire Mine, we had a lot of data with very little calcium, and a few samples had the high calcium. And again, we're interested in that because we, it was known that the high calcium minerals were the ones that are most bioavailable. So we were looking for euconite. We never found our senior but um, 
we did find these minerals out here that weren't corresponding to any known, uh, previously known metal. So that we call unknown uh, calcium iron oxidate. Uh, and so Pat Tunk had a diagram similarly. And then there was another study by Walker in Nova Scotia that had a bunch of unknown samples out of here too. So it looks like there's really something going on here with the calcium arsenic in the iron system. So where there's a need for future work to characterize some of the minerals for these technologies in the center part here. And uh, just a picture of some other neat things you can do with the microprobe. Uh, if you put it into backscatter mode, you can get it to uh, give, get your maps of the distribution of different elements. So here's an arsenopyrite grain that's partially replaced by oxides. You can see most of it's iron now. The brighter colors are the uh, iron rich. There's a vein here with iron that's low in arsenic. There's iron and arsenic together in the middle here, which is the old arsenopyrite. And we see that there's very, almost no sulfur left here in the original arsenopyrite grain. Uh, and you can see that it's. Um, replaced largely by, by uh, iron oxide, but some of that iron oxide is very high in arsenic. But you can tell from the shape of this that this was originally an arsenopyrite grain. So I want to show you briefly the, the QEM scan. It's, it's pretty cool technology. Who's here with the QEM scan? <coughs> okay, well, this, is, this is a tool I think you might want to use because it's, it's coming out of the cost and it's, it's basically like an SEM on steroids. It gives you uh, Basically, four detectors all counting at the same time, so it, it only it has to sit for just literally milliseconds on a, on a single point, and it makes about a thousand counts, and it, it takes the ratio of the elements it finds, and it, just, and it assigns it to a mineral, and it can make maps of your your thin section, and so here's for example some of what this polished section looked like in uh, reflected light, and when we look at a QEM scan image where we we trained it uh, to identify low arsenic hydroxide oxides and higher arsenic. Uh, iron oxides, and the low ones are in brown, and the higher stick ones are in green. Arsenopyrites in red, and pyrites in yellow. And you can see that the high arsenic iron oxides are right in this area around the arsenopyrite grain, and the brown gunky stuff is all out here in the pyrite. So it would be virtually impossible to tell that with the naked eye, but here we have a tool you can use to map this out. Uh, basically, overnight, you can do you know hundreds of samples and uh, you get the maps like this. So I think it's, it's pretty neat. It's being used for a lot of other studies, like provenance studies. Anybody who's had to do point counting, you know, you can train the computer to do it. And it's used a lot in metallurgy. And mining, a lot of mining companies own this instrument. There's two of them in, in, in Utah, at the University of Utah. There's a couple in Boulder, Colorado. And like I said, there's quite a few out there in the private sector as well. So it's a, a tool, I think, uh, is an application to a lot of different uh, studies where you want to get quantitative information from thin sectors because you don't want to go blind counting yourself. Uh, here's just another example of a thin scan map that's pretty instructive. Uh, again, map out. Now, now this one, we, we took the additional step of taking the same polish section from the quen scan and then taking it to the synchrotron and soon we can learn about speciation and mineralogy uh, from the same area. So if you look at this rectangle, we've got these areas called A, B, and C. A is arsenopyrite, B is kind of a HFA type zone that has hydrospheric arsenates, and C is a, is a pyrite and, and perihydrite zone. And so again, A, B, and C. A is arsenopyrite. This area here is, and then what we have here in the, on the, on the little green dots are uh, counts of arsenic uh, on the horizontal axis and iron on the vertical axis. And the, these arrays, and you, you can see the little uh, red dots here, but this, this is called masking, where you tell the software to only consider the data that's surrounded by the red dots. We can learn that the, the ratio of arsenic to iron based on electron microprobe is around 0.85 to 0.95. And that's basically almost one to one arsenic and arsenic to iron. That represents arsenopyrite. And that, map, that mapped out into these areas that we knew were arsenopyrite from chrome scan and, and optical microscopy. This area with sort of medium slopes was the, uh, was the uh, HFA zone that had a little bit less arsenic to iron. And then the zone over here that was uh, zone C was mostly pyrite with some, some of the HFO and that had a lower arsenic to iron ratio. So it's basically telling us what we already know, but by calibrating this way to the micro and the same samples, then we can interpret these slopes on a whole host of other samples and know what we're looking at. So this turned out to be a useful way to, to make a connection between the two different techniques we're using. Okay, so there's a little more data on this slide, and this will be my last rich, data-rich slide before we wrap up, but I wanted to give you some sense of how we're using data at Empire Mind to understand bioavailability. And it's a little hard to read, and I apologize for that, but we have basically, uh, 20, uh, 20 samples that we've characterized 
in this case, the arsenic excess or extended X-ray absorption fine structure. And by matching the, the wiggles on these curves to, to known compounds or model compounds, we've interpreted what's present in terms of the arsenic species. And we, again, these are samples from throughout the Empire Mine area. And uh, Adrian Foster has, has used the uh, cluster analysis here to see, well, which ones are similar to each other in terms of these characteristics. And she's shown that, for example, EM1 and EM21, which happen to be among the highest in bioavailability, in vivo, relative bioavailability, that's, that's the pink study, which is, again, the gold standard for bioavailable arsenic. The four samples that really stand out are shown in yellow. And they tend to have um, similar mineralogy to each other. They have, um, here's our, our color code. And, and the, um, some of the things they share are this calcium iron arsenate that we were looking for. There's not very much of it, this bright green, but two of those four samples have it, and they're the only ones that do. And then there's this phase we weren't really expecting at all, arsenic fiber or arsenate sorbed onto gibbsite, which is an aluminum hydroxide. Not about abundant mineral, but it may be kind of a proxy for other aluminum bearing minerals. So, this is an area we have, we're, we're, we're looking into in more detail. But this dark green is coming out of the XAPS as aluminum gibbsite association. We need perhaps to get a better model compound for aluminum sorbed onto, say, aluminum silicates. Uh, and then finally, our xenopyrite is the least bioavailable. Uh, this less than 5% is our EN18. And we kind of knew this going in the EVH over here. That's the one that had more than half our xenopyrite. And it's the least bioavailable of all of them. So we are seeing the expected relationship between the calcium iron arsenates being the most bioavailable, our xenopyrite the least. It's those ones in the middle that we're still not so sure about. All these ones with a lot of uh, hydrostatic, uh, very hydride and urtite, we're still trying to understand exactly what's going on in these tests with, with, the, uh, with the iron arsenate relationships among all the other minerals. Uh, Running a little short on time. Uh, do people want to hear about grain size distribution? Or should I wrap up? What do you think? Five more minutes? Grain size. Okay. <laughs> You're free to leave at any time. <laughs> okay, so this is the work of Chris Kim down in Chapman University, as I mentioned. He, uh, he's been doing some really cool work where he takes samples of mine waste and he sieves it physically into, in this case, nine different bins. I think he said as many as 11. And here's the, the uh, yeah, that's 11, it's less than 20 microns. We're actually doing this in Sacramento also using a wet sitting method for looking at mercury. He's using a dry sitting method and um, he's breaking it into all these different uh, size ranges based on microns. So that just for reference, uh, 75 microns, some people would consider fine sand and silt, sometimes you use 63 or 64 microns. For it. Basically, S8, 9, 10, 11 are silt and clay. Uh, S7, 6, 5, 4, and 3 are sand. And then uh, S1 is basically coarser than sand, or basically pebbles and uh, pebble material. So uh, in terms of the mass distribution, there's a lot of stuff that's coarser. 35% of it didn't fit through the basically the, the, uh, the 2.8 millimeter sieve, uh, which is, I think, uh, that's the quarter inch sieve. Um, but so you have a relatively small amount of this fine grain material. But when you look at the arsenic concentration of it, the fines have a lot higher concentration of arsenic than the bulk. It is the average bulk of this particular sample had about 3,500 ppm, so it was one of the higher ones, but the average fines were like 9,000 ppm. Okay, so it's really important to understand what's going on with the finer grain material. Also, I mentioned 250 microns is the size that we looked at for the, uh, the studies of, of bioavailability, so that's S6, 7, and, and up. Um, EPA has determined that it, it's, this fine sand that's under 250 microns as well as stick to your skin and might become ingested. The, the, uh, everybody heard of the so-called pica child, somebody who actually eats dirt? Like one out of 100 kids apparently eats like a handful of dirt a day or something like that, a substantial amount of dirt. And, uh, and there's some parts of the world where a lot, a lot of people eat dirt. But anyway, um, it's not necessarily bad for you, but if there's a lot of arsenic in there, it's pretty definitely bad for you. So they base these risk assessments on kids who eat dirt. And, that, and then 250 microns is the size of dirt that sticks to your fingers and so if you don't wash your hands before eating or you know, anybody can uh, ingest arsenic in that, in that size range. When it comes to an inhalation risk, if you probably heard PM10 and PM2.5 and stuff that is risk when you get bad air quality. It's pretty hard to sieve things down that low. So we use the 20 micron as sort of the proxy for the finer grain material and the very finest grain that can potentially be inhaled. So these are some plots that Chris made of just looking at arsenic concentrations, a function of these 
nine different particle sizes. And we can see that different samples kind of fall in different categories where some of them have really are strongly higher in arsenic and low at a finer grade. Some of them really don't uh, have that much of a trajectory. Uh, another thing he's done is uh, looked at plotted the con arsenic concentration here on a log scale versus bioaccessible. This is the gastric leach or the stomach leach. And we see some interesting trends within each sample. We see as you go to finer grain sizes, you get higher concentration of both, and they follow some of these trends along a really relatively constant amount of, uh, of bioavailability. Uh, and then, but there is variation at a given concentration where some are more bioavailable than others, and this is where the mineralogy can come into play. So by tearing it apart into all these different grain size bins, I think it adds additional understanding of what's going on and allows us to, and he's actually in process of doing the synchrotron speciation work uh, as well as some of these other leach tests on these different grain size fractions. But we see this overall increase of bioavailability with higher arsenic concentration, but it tends to be closer around this 1% bioavailable. That's kind of the, the, uh, the typical amount. But again, some of these samples are more than 10% bioavailable, and others are down or lower. So we still see that range, but there's this overall correlation. Uh, as I mentioned, the, these very fine particles are the ones that penetrate down into the lungs, and, uh, and this is why particle size is really important to understand in, in, in terms of environmental fate. And uh, uh, this is some other work with Chris is where he's compared the Empire Mine to some other sites. Ransburg is a big site in Southern California down in the Mojave Desert. Uh, in fact, these other sites are all in the Mojave Desert. But they, they also have kind of a similar um, correlation between overall initial arsenic and bioavailability, bioaccessibility. He, he actually uses a one leach. I mentioned gastric leach, which simulates stomach fluid at pH of 1.9 and 37 degrees C, body temperature, and so forth. There's a different leach test that you can do if one wants to simulate what's going on in the lung. There are actually two different types of fluids in the lung, a neutral one and a more acidic one when the white blood cells attack these invading particles. And so both of those are important to do. In this case, I believe he's looking at the, uh, the more neutral, um, oops, more neutral um, lung leach. Okay. So I better uh, wrap things up. I wanted to mention that our Empire Mine has a neat wetlands treatment system. If, you, if you've been to the park lately, you've probably driven right by this uh, wetlands, where got, the road actually goes right between wetlands one and two, and they, uh, they, they pump water up from a portal that's draining the mine, called the Magenta Mine Portal, and they, they have a settling pond with these two wetlands that are removing iron and uh, manganese and arsenic. And so uh, there's a settling pond, the water flows to wetland one, and then it flows to wetland two, and then back down to the creek. And uh, this just demonstrates how effective that, how effective that system has been at removing iron and arsenic and manganese uh, in the first couple of years of its operation. So um, this is on a field trip again in June. Uh, the folks who were running it show the, uh, the water coming in, uh, it settles nicely and flocculates and, and uh, is a very, it's kind of a passive treatment system. And I think this is a, it's saving them a lot of money from an active treatment where you would actually have to add chemicals to the water to make the arsenic come out. In this case, they basically are causing the iron to oxidize, and the iron absorbs the arsenic, and then it settles out, and, uh, and uh, they end up with much less clean water. So that's a pretty much a success story as far as uh, Empire Mine water. So to wrap up, what have we learned about arsenic at Empire Mine? We, uh, we've learned it's complicated, that we need multiple lines of evidence to understand the relationship between mineralogy, bioavailability, bioaccessibility. We, we saw this difference of the ratio, arsenic to iron ratio, and the weather product is higher than that in the original pyrite. And uh, my main interpretation of that is that these rocks have arsenopyrite in them as well. And so basically, you're making iron oxide from oxidizing pyrite, and there's arsenic in solution that came from the nearby arsenopyrite grain, and that is loaded on even more arsenic onto the weather product, even though we've got the weather product right around the pyrite grain. No, it isn't a closed system, and, and some of the arsenic on that other product came from a different grain, it might have, like an arsenic product grain nearby. That's my best guess is what's going on there. So you might not see the same relationship in Southern Cal Southern Mountain Road where, where there is the, the, the arsenic product. The uh, in vitro gastric results and the relative bioavailability of the in vivo results, they, they do both track with the mineralogy. Again, the calcium ion arsenates have the highest bioavailability. We also saw this strange uh, arsenic 5 gypsite phase that needs more characterization. We have the lowest bioavailability in arsenopyrite as we expected. More work's needed on the calcium iron arsenates. We have some unknown compositions, plus butanide itself is important on stoichiometry. 
Um, one thing I didn't mention but came out was kind of interesting in our, in our studies. Every time we used the electron microprobe to get a quantitative concentration in perihydride, which is the hydrospheric oxide, we always got 1% silica. And at first, you know, we weren't sure if it was really there, but we looked in literature and it's pretty typical to get 1% silica in an iron oxide like that. Uh, and it, we think it explains why so little of this HFO material dissolves in the stomach fluids. Because when we look at the iron concentrations of the, of the samples that have been submitted to the in vitro tests, the gastric uh, leach tests, we're getting very low iron. But you know, if you were to put iron oxides in pH 1.9, they should dissolve. The mineral is supposed to be soluble. But the kinetics of the solution, if you only have one hour to do the test, because that's the average amount of time that materials in the stomach, that silica basically armors the iron oxide and it will not dissolve that much in that hour, even at that, the, the body temperature and the low pH. And so that may have a lot to do with the fact that the arsenic is not high available from the ferry hydrate, even though it's probably the main uh, mineral that hosts arsenic in these samples. So again, uh, mineralogy is one thing, thermodynamics is another thing, and then kinetics may rule the world, basically, in terms of rates of things that really affect things that matter to us, like bioavailability. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention is that we have developed a new technique, most of the people at Ohio State in this project, they modify the gastric leach by adding ascorbic acid, which affects the, uh, the redox content, the redox uh, situation in the stomach, which previously had never been controlled. So that was a little twist they had at the end to get a better uh, fit between the two types of testing they were doing, the pigs and the test tubes. They, they found by adding ascorbic acid, which is naturally occurring in the stomach, they got the redox in a better range, and now they're getting a better match. You know, time will tell whether that particular test they developed will also lead to good correlation in other studies, in other areas. That's uh, to be done next, but I think this study was able to uh, make some advances uh, in this area. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Happy to take any questions? I have a question. Yeah, the slide up there is about the cross-section through the mind. Yeah. The, the general one about the... Uh, this, this one here, uh, with the treatment? Yeah.